Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Exploring by the CDR Pants Hangout. Uh, my name is Joe Grabowski, and for those who don't know, we're all about bringing science, adventure, and conservation into classrooms across North America and beyond. Um, very excited today to be joined uh, once again by George Karunas. Uh, for those who have never caught a hangout with George before, uh, George is a professional explorer. He travels the world and seeks out situations that other people are usually running away from. You'll see George going the other way. Um, volcanoes, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, forest fires, and he's fascinated by the power of our planet. And his goal um, is to share that with us, to share that with everybody. So he is the host of Angry Planet, and he's also the chapter head of the Ontario Nunavut Explorers Club. So George has joined us a few times and talked about volcanoes, but today he's going to talk about a very different subject. So George, it's great to have you joining us today. Thanks so much, Joe. I appreciate it. I love doing these uh, these hangouts. Fantastic. Hi, everybody. So today it's going to be all about uh, tornadoes, which are nature's most powerful winds. I've been a tornado chaser in, a, in addition to all of my other explorations all around the world into 60 plus countries. Uh, but tornadoes are sort of where I got my start and how I got into documenting extreme forces of nature. Let me uh, see if I can get this screen share thing working here. Whoops. You guys see that okay? Looks good. Excellent. So... Yeah, um, tornadoes are, are certainly fascinating. I, I love them. They, they happen in all kinds of different places, but the central United States is the most uh, prolific place for uh, tornadoes. I believe we have some students from Texas. I spend a lot of time in Texas. George, and, I'm just going to uh, pause you for a second. It loaded. Yeah. It just didn't go full screen. It did not go full screen. No, I can see the, the individual slides. It just didn't go full screen. I don't know why. There it goes. Let me see. Can you see that? Is that full yeah. screen? Yeah, it came up now. Cool. So that's full screen as well. Um, or it's, not. It, it's closer. We're up to, I can see them, um, each one, not... one slide now. So that, that'll do. That'll yeah. do there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's kind of weird, but okay, whatever. We'll make it work. Can we push play? Like, would it play as a slideshow? That's what I'm trying to do. Oh, okay. Let me see here. Screen share is on. That's full screen for me. George, when you picked to share the screen, did you pick just the PowerPoint or the full screen? Oh, you know what? That's what I need to do. Joe, Perfect. you are brilliant. You've done this uh, before. Once or twice, yeah. <laughs> so if I go desktop, that should do it. And now when I go here and I do this, we should have now the full screen. We got it. Sweet. Okay. <laughs> so no, I don't actually have a tornado in my hand. That's just a trick of the camera and the angle and everything. This was in Oklahoma a couple of years ago. I spent a lot of time traveling all over the world um, to, like I mentioned, 60 plus countries from Greenland to Antarctica, from Australia, New Zealand, all over Africa, Siberia, you name it. But in terms of my explorations, I got my start doing tornado chasing in places like Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Texas. Those are the places in the world that get the most number of tornadoes. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. A tornado is nothing more than a violently rotating column of air that's in contact with the ground that comes from a large thunderstorm. And they're very specific type of thunderstorm that we call supercells. And I'll talk more about those in a little bit. But sometimes these tornadoes, they look black. Sometimes they look white. Here, this one from Kansas, you can see this wonderful um, plume of dirt that's being lifted up, vacuumed up by this tornado as it crosses the road directly in front of where we were. So finding these things can be very difficult. It's You've heard, I'm sure, the saying, trying to find a needle in a haystack. Well, imagine that haystack is moving at 60 miles an hour and is not paying attention to any traffic laws. And you're trying to follow it and maintain the speed limit and, and stop at stop signs and everything all at the same time. So they can be very difficult to track. I've learned over the years how to forecast um, storms by myself. So I can go and look at the different uh, details of a weather forecast and get a really good idea of what the atmosphere is doing and whether tornadoes are likely to happen that particular day. 
And sometimes we have to figure that out days in advance. Uh, this particular tornado was in Bennington, Kansas, and it sat still in one farmer's field for about 45 minutes and just sat there grinding up the field. Luckily, it didn't hit anything major. Of course, sometimes these tornadoes do hit towns, and when that, whenever that does happen, my team and I, we always stop and lend help because they can be, of course, extremely destructive. Some of the winds can reach up to over 300 miles an hour in the strongest tornadoes, so over 500 kilometers an hour. Some of them, they're just touched down for a mere couple of, of moments. This one was on the ground for maybe 20 seconds. I managed to get my camera out, take the picture, and a few seconds later, it was gone. And this is the type of storm that I look for when we're trying to chase tornadoes. This is a supercell thunderstorm. The height of this can be, oh, some of them can be 60,000 feet tall, which is twice the height of Mount Everest. And the spot where you see that lightning bolt, that's where a tornado would occur if this storm were producing tornadoes. Now, not all storms are supercells. Not all supercells produce tornadoes. They're actually quite rare. About 10% of all uh, thunderstorms are supercells. They're much larger. They rotate. And uh, of those 10%, only about 10% of those storms produce tornadoes. So they're very, very rare. And uh, finding them can be quite difficult. So just by looking at this, this photo, I can tell a lot of things. I can tell the storm is moving from left to right. Uh, the warm, moist air that you'd be feeling if you were watching this storm would be hitting you in the back, going into the storm and rising up where you see that sunset, that, that nice uh, color from the sunset lighting up the storm at the back. That air then goes up and cools, forms the cloud, which then goes very high in the atmosphere, all the way up towards the stratosphere, almost into space. And as it rises, if the weather conditions are just right, it can rotate as that air is rising up. So if you have very calm winds at the surface and then as you get higher in the atmosphere, the wind speed gets stronger, any air that wants to rise will end up spinning. Of course, we know that hot air rises and that's one of the most important things about uh, what forms these storms. You don't see these kind of storms in the winter time, at least not here where I am in Canada because it's just too cold for that. Sometimes, if you're, in, uh, if you're in the rain and the rain starts getting heavier and then heavier and then you start getting small hail and then large hail and then the hail stops, that's the time when I would expect there to potentially be a tornado. So imagine this on this diagram, the storm is moving from left to right. You'd see this massive cloud coming at you. Um, you would start getting the rain, the heavy rain, then into the potentially the hail and then things might get quiet and there might be a tornado. Sometimes the tornadoes are actually wrapped up in rain, which makes them almost impossible to see. But sometimes these storms are absolutely beautiful. These supercell storms also bring the worst type of flooding. Uh, they can drop tremendous amounts of rain in a very short amount of time. They can also produce brilliant and dangerous lightning. Here's a picture of the CN Tower, not far from where I am right now being struck by lightning from one of these storms. A single bolt of lightning can be five times hotter than the surface of the sun. So if you're outdoors in a storm, you don't want to be hit by that. So try not to hide underneath a tree, get indoors if you can. But also these storms can produce monstrous hail, sometimes hail to the size of baseballs or larger. Because that warm rising air is so vigorous and so strong, it can hold these hailstones up in the atmosphere for a very long time in very cold temperatures, many degrees below freezing. So ice just keeps building up and building up and building up until the stone gets so big that it drops down. And let me tell you, I've been hit by these and they hurt. So if you start getting hail, again, go indoors. I've had many windows smashed on my storm chasing vehicles because of hail that looks like that. And of course, tornadoes are probably the most destructive thing that can be formed from these supercell storms. So where do they happen? Tornadoes are found mainly in the United States. Of all the countries of the world, the United States gets about 75% of the world's tornadoes. And of those, most of them happen 
in the central part of the state. Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska. They do extend up into Canada with the Prairie Provinces, Alberta, um, uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and also here in Ontario, where I am, we get uh, tornadoes as well, but nothing compares to the number that they get in the US. In terms of worldwide, they only happen in a few places, uh, typically, North America, parts of Argentina, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Bangladesh gets a lot of tornadoes, as well uh, parts of China, Japan, and they can be found pretty much everywhere in Europe for the most part. So they're, they're pretty common. All you need to have, well, not I wouldn't say common, but they certainly can be found in quite a few places. Um, but you have to have the right combination of weather. You need this clashing of air masses, warm, moist air that comes up from the Gulf of Mexico, combines with cooler, drier air that swoops down from Canada. Sometimes you'll get a low pressure system that forces these two air masses to clash together. And to add some energy to that, we have the jet stream, which is a river of extremely fast moving wind way up in the atmosphere. And you get all those elements coming together right over Kansas and Oklahoma, especially in the springtime every year. So let me play a little video here for you guys. This was in South Dakota. A very large tornado was uh, touched down in a field. A crazy idea. My team and I are pursuing it. And I'm trying to find the spot where the tornado is going to cross the road in front of me. If a tornado warning has been issued for where you live, the safest thing you can do is go and hide in the basement. No sign of One of the most dangerous things you can do is get in a car because a tornado will take your car and crush it like a Coke can and toss it into a field. So here I pulled over, I can see that this tornado is spinning away. It's gonna cross the road right behind this little house. It does not hit the house, thankfully. But the wind is so strong that everything in the vehicle is being sucked out, like a giant vacuum cleaner is pulling everything out of the van as soon as I open the door. And coming towards me, watch the headlights of the oncoming car. This guy gets very, very close to being hit by this tornado. Wow. Very close call. I don't know what he was thinking. Perhaps uh, he didn't realize that there was a tornado coming for him. I don't know how you don't see that. But uh, definitely being in your car is not a very safe place. Uh, there are many people that are injured and unfortunately killed in their cars during tornadoes. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Twister, you know that scene where there's a cow that gets lifted by the tornado and goes flying? Well, I've had a similar situation, but not with flying cows. This tornado was in uh, eastern Colorado, very close to uh, the border with Oklahoma. It was moving towards me, but I also had some very large hail that was hitting the roof of the vehicle. You can hear the, 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 the sound of the hail hitting the roof. And uh, we had a bit of a problem because I'm trying to escape the giant hail, plus the tornado was coming towards me. But I ended up with a bit of a problem with the local cows. The next problem. Cows. We've got cows. We got a herd of cows that decided to uh, escape the storm. And these cows would not move. They wouldn't get out of the way. I'm honking the horn. <laughs> and I'm laughing at the time, but it was pretty serious because we had baseball hail about to hit us and a tornado coming towards us. So that was pretty funny. <laughs> so it was definitely one of those experiences that I will not uh, soon forget. <laughs> this year was a particularly um, interesting tornado season. The, the number of tornadoes that happen usually peaks in May and June. And I spend usually those two months traveling like a nomad, just living in, in hotels across Tornado Alley in the central part of the United States. And we had one day in particular near Dodge City, Kansas, where one storm produced at least 10 tornadoes, just one after the other after the other. And we were following this storm for quite some time as it produced just multiple tornadoes, sometimes several tornadoes at once. 
they and they were in all these different shapes and sizes here this one looks very very strong and it was uh this one ended up hitting um the garbage dump outside of town luckily nobody was uh, injured but it did a fair amount of damage and at the same time we had smaller tornadoes that were forming sort of simultaneously here you can see we've got a large one on the left and if you look really closely on the right you can see a skinny little rope-like tornado that was coming down so at one point i believe we had three tornadoes simultaneously uh, happening just from this one storm and some of them got extremely large so as beautiful as they are we have to try and be careful of course they're they're very very dangerous but i love watching them one thing that does happen with tornadoes is as they get weaker what happens is they'll form they'll get strong and then they weaken sometimes it takes a couple of minutes sometimes it takes an hour for that to happen but as they weaken they tend to take on this ropey appearance that can be quite beautiful and that's usually an indication of a weakening tornado when they're big like this, when a tornado is wider than it is tall, we call that a wedge. And these are typically very strong tornadoes. It's hard to tell, though, because just by looking at one, you can't tell exactly how strong the tornado is. There's no real indicator between the size of the tornado and the strength of the tornado. But it's it's uh, sometimes you have narrow tornadoes that are very strong. Sometimes you have wide tornadoes that are very weak. But generally, the wider they are, pardon me, the stronger they are. And uh, this one, a little harder to see. It's getting wrapped up by the rain. These tornadoes were all from the same storm. So it was just incredible. Again, two on the ground at the same time. We'll have different areas of rotation in the storm. And when one area is finishing up, a new area will start to form, usually a little bit further to the north and a little bit further to the west. And that's exactly what happened here. There's my team, me in the center. Uh, the gentleman on the left is my uh, good friend, Mark Robinson. He's a, a weather network meteorologist. And uh, Jacqueline Whittall is with us. She's also a meteorologist with the weather network. I do a lot of work with them. Uh, chasing different storms across North America and all over. Um, if you've ever uh, been tuning in and you see a program called Storm Hunters, well, that's us, the three of us. We travel all over. And this was the, the sunset that happened after that uh, 10 tornado day. Sometimes you'll get these, these puffy clouds called mamadas. And they're very interesting. They're very high altitude clouds. They're up way up near the stratosphere. And when the sun sets, they lit, they light up just absolutely beautifully, casting this wonderful orange hue over. So if you ever see that in the summertime, odds are that there's a, uh, a thunderstorm near you, not necessarily a tornado. These types of clouds don't uh, mean that there is a tornado nearby, but it does mean that there's a thunderstorm. So whenever there's a thunderstorm, there is always at least some small chance of a tornado. Now, Someone was asking earlier, what was my scariest encounter with tornadoes? Well, this was it. And I'm going to show you a little video clip here, but let me set this up first. I sometimes work with a tornado chasing tour company. So people will travel from all over the world to come and travel with me while I chase these tornadoes and document them. And we had this one encounter in Nebraska a couple of years ago where the tornado was, we saw one in the distance. And then a second one formed right beside us, so close that it was invisible. We couldn't even see it. And there was a piece of farming equipment. It was a, one of these irrigation circles that they, the farmers use to water their crops. And as I'm driving along this dirt road, the tornado pushes this piece of farm equipment over and it completely smashes our windshield while I'm driving. So you get to see, I'll show you the video here, you get to see the, the, the impact of this equipment hitting the windshield and then you'll see a reverse angle of my reaction as it's happening so it's uh it was very interesting this ended up on cnn that that night and scared my mother because i told her i was going to be safe today tornado. so there's the first tornado it's very distant but it's moving towards us there it is So now I'm trying to get away from the storm, setting up the camera. 
The turn is now formed just off to our right. And watch what happens here. Here it comes. Yikes. That takes a lot of wind to push one of those things over. So there, there I am driving. I can tell the tornado's about to form. I'm leveling the camera. And then it's about to hit the windshield. And look at the concentration on my face. <laughs> Luckily, we were all safe. And there was very almost no damage to the car other than the windshield and the uh, side mirror. <laughs> so we got very, uh, very lucky. There was very little damage to the car considering what just happened. So that was one of those experiences that uh, I will not soon forget. Let me turn off the screen sharing here. I think I. You're back. I'm back. Yeah. Awesome. There we go. So, there are a lot of uh, uh, people out there that have uh, started chasing storms, and and um, there's uh, whenever you get one storm that goes up, we tend to have quite a few people that will gravitate towards that one storm. So it's really fun for me because I get to see colleagues and friends that I don't see throughout the year. We all find ourselves underneath these same storms at the same time. So it's, uh, it's really good because we all have to do our weather forecasting and try and be at the right place at the right time. It's, uh, it's very difficult, but it's very rewarding when we're able to do it. And there are people that make a living as storm chasers. So it is a career path. There are not many of us, but it is a thing that can be done. An interesting way to apply science to an interesting potential job, uh, you know, career in the future. All right, George, that's... Let's take a uh, bunch of questions. Yes, for sure. George, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing uh, some storm chasing adventures with us. You were just mentioning that um, you do encounter a lot of colleagues under the same storm. And I was just curious. I was wondering if it's becoming maybe too crowded. Do you ever kind of encounter amateurs who are maybe in over their head? Is that something that's starting to happen? Yeah, absolutely. What's happened is the technology has gotten so much better all I need now for storm chasing is a phone with a good internet connection. In the old days, I needed all this extra equipment to get the information. Because it's gotten easier, there are more people that are out there doing it. And there's been times when I've actually had problems with traffic on these country roads in the middle of nowhere trying to get around these storms. All right. Well, let's meet some of our classrooms. So um, the first group we have joining us, I'll turn their microphone on, Mrs. Vick's class in Fitzroy Harbor, not Nova Scotia, near <laughs> Ottawa. They're a grade three classroom. And um, your microphone's on. Excellent, that was awesome. We have a ton of questions for you. Now, some of them might not be for tornadoes, but just about you and your life. That's okay. I'll Starla. answer any question you have. Excellent. Starla, can you stand and ask your question, please? Really loud. Here. Oh, she said, how did you convince your wife to get married by a live volcano? Okay, <laughs> so, so you guys have been doing your research. Excellent. I'm proud of you. Uh, yeah, 10 years ago, my wife and I got married on the crater's edge of an exploding volcano in the South Pacific. And as we had the ceremony, lava was flying through the air. And uh, I, basically, when I proposed to her, I asked her to marry me. She said yes. Then I said, well, what do you think about the idea of getting married on a beautiful tropical South Pacific island? She said, yes. And then I slipped in at the end, well, how about on the crater's edge of an exploding volcano? And she said, yes, faster to the volcano question than she did to the will you marry me question. So that worked out just, just perfectly. And during the ceremony, the volcano was putting on a great show, throwing lava through the air. It was amazing. If you haven't seen it, look it up on YouTube. We will. We will. Can we have another one? Kieran? Uh, have you been to the Midnight Zone? 
Have you been to the Midnight Zone in the ocean? Oh, no, I haven't. That's one place I would love to go. I've been a scuba diver for many, many years, but going down deep where the light never penetrates, I've never had the opportunity to do that. So that's really high on my list of places in this world that I want to explore. All right, let's grab one more and then we'll visit another class. Okay, Jacob. Have you ever got sucked into a tornado? Well, I've never been sucked into a tornado, but I have been in a tornado. And what happens is it's not so much that the tornado is going to suck you up. It's that the tornado is going to hit you with flying debris. And that's what causes most injuries during a tornado is actually stuff that's flying through the air. It could be two by fours. It could be bricks. It could be a car. <laughs> um, so I had an encounter quite a few years ago in Oklahoma where it was nighttime. I got on the edge of a tornado and there were garbage cans and pieces of roofs flying past me. It was denting my car. I had to drive and hide behind a shopping mall to get out of the way of all the flying debris. And that was pretty scary. Thank you. All right. Odds are we'll have time to swing by for one wrap-up question, but we'll, we'll introduce another one of our classrooms joining us. We have Mrs. Cooks and Mrs. Jameson's grade fives joining us from Brampton, Ontario. And I think they're a group that equal about 60 or so students. So let me make awesome. sure your microphone's on. Go Brampton. There you go. What made you want to be a storm chaser? What made me want to do this? Well, I've always had a uh, tremendous passion for nature and science. And as I got older, I got into photography and travel. And it allowed me to combine all those things that I loved. My uh, education background is actually in engineering. I used to build recording studios for a living. And I took that knowledge and uh, the education that I had, and then I, tr I trained myself to learn about geology, about weather, about forecasting, about all of the things that I need to do to be uh, what I am today, a storm chaser, explorer, adventurer. And uh, it just started when I was a kid. My, my heroes when I was a kid were ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau and uh, Indiana Jones. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how many tornadoes are there per year? How many tornadoes are there per year? That's a really great question. Between 800 to 1,200 tornadoes per year happen in the U.S. So it really does depend on what uh, what the weather pattern is like. But usually on a low end, 800 on a busy year, about 1,200. Canada gets between 60 to 100 per year, and Ontario gets about a dozen every year. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hey. My question is, what is the most dangerous experience you've had as a storm chaser? Um, probably being in the middle of Hurricane Katrina. The thing with tornadoes is that I can see them and I can tell which way they're moving and I can get out of the way. When I was in the middle of Hurricane Katrina, because hurricanes are so much larger, a thousand times larger than a tornado, for me to document a hurricane, I have to put myself in front of it and then let the hurricane just run over me. And that can sometimes take several days for that to happen. And Hurricane Katrina was so very strong that... I didn't know what was going to happen over the next 24 hours. I was in a steel reinforced concrete parking garage on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, very close to New Orleans. And there were pieces of metal flying through the air like helicopter blades. There were pieces of, of stone and glass that felt like bullets hitting you because the wind was so strong. And the flood was incredible because the hurricane will push a mountain of water inland. That can be, well, Hurricane Katrina was, the water level rose 28 feet, so 10 meters above normal. So that was pretty scary. Thank you. 
got one more question for you right now. Hi. Hi. Have you ever been hurt um, during when you were a storm chaser, like outside? Have, you ever Have I ever been hurt? Uh, I've never been seriously hurt. I have had uh, hailstones, big hailstones, hit me. I've got <laughs> bruises from them on my feet, on my back, things like that. But I've never had any serious injury in any of my explorations all over the world. So that's because I try to do things as safely as I can. I try to take as many safety precautions as I can and learn as much as I can about what it is I'm pursuing and documenting before I get there so that I don't have too many surprises. So whether it's luck or whether it's preparation, why I've never been injured, uh, I'm just thankful. <laughs> but I have had a few little minor injuries, but nothing to write home about. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Did we get another one or no? Did we get another question or no? I think we can squeeze one more in on this round. Maybe not. Oh, sorry, George. Yep. Uh, what the is the what is the biggest tornado in the world? The biggest tornado in the world was the El Reno, Oklahoma tornado of May thirty first, two thousand thirteen. I was there. I witnessed it. It was four point three kilometers wide. That's two point six miles. It was huge. It didn't even look like a tornado. It just looked like a dark smear across the horizon. Oh. Massive. George, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you now, Joe. Okay, we the computer froze on our end, so I improvised. I'm on my cell phone now. Oh, um, okay. Because we're still working. Everything's good here. Good. So I'm going to run it from my cell phone the rest. But <laughs> I'm having a hard time hearing you, Joe, but I can, I can see you there. Closer. Can you hear now? That's a little better. Okay. Our next group is from Niagara Falls. It's Mr. Taylor's class. Go ahead with your question. Niagara Falls, go. Hey, guys. Uh, we're just in a class change, actually. Oh, they're doing a class change. We have two questions, though, if you want to say them. Sarah, go ahead. Okay. Go for it. Uh, what do you have to do to go about uh, being a storm chaser? Remember. What do you have to do to go about being a storm chaser? Uh, well, there's, there's no... Um, there's no university program to be a storm chaser. The more you know about meteorology, the better. Um, I'm not a meteorologist. A lot of my colleagues are, but not all storm chasers are meteorologists. As a matter of fact, some of the best storm chasers are not meteorologists. So what you really need is to uh, learn how to forecast weather. And there's lots of resources online for that. And uh, you have to be very passionate about uh, storms and, and want to get out there. So. There's no one set path. Okay, and do you work for a company or do you do this independently? Uh, do I work for a company or do, do I do it sort of just on my own? Yeah, like do you just do it for just to do it? Or? Uh, both actually. Um, sometimes I'm filming for my TV show, Angry Planet. Sometimes I'm working for the, the Weather Network. Sometimes I'm just doing it on my own because I want to do it. Uh, it really does depend. Uh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Brayden, um, have you ever lost any equipment while storm chasing? Have I ever lost any equipment? <laughs> Lots. I I can break. You name the camera, I can break it. Uh, I've destroyed Sony's. I've destroyed Canons. I've destroyed Nikon's. Um, my car is beat up like you wouldn't believe. The hood of my car looks like a jealous ex-girlfriend took a hammer to it because of all the hail dents. Smashed out the windshield so many times I can't count. So yeah, I go through a lot of equipment. I got one more question for the class. No, they left. Uh, we're kind of linking this to our climate change unit that we have in grade 10. Yes. And part of that science scientists seem to suggest that we're getting more frequent, more intense storms. And I'm wondering, over the course of your career, have you seen an increase in the frequency or severity of storms? Or do you think that's anecdotal? What's your take on it? Right. That's a great question. Um, I've seen a lot of direct effects of climate change all over the world. Um, glaciers are cheating, rising sea levels, and I've witnessed this all firsthand. We still don't have a definitive link between climate change 
and tornado production. It's, the science is still not there yet. Now, when it comes to storms like hurricanes, that is a bit more of a, that we know, um, that as the ocean warms up, that provides more fuel for these hurricanes. So they will likely be stronger. And we're seeing that in some cases, especially in the Western Pacific. Um, but when it comes to tornadoes, we still don't know. There are a lot of researchers who are working on that right now. So I'm very curious to see what we learn over the next five years. Awesome. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. You're very welcome. All right. Great questions, guys. Let's swing back to Mrs. Cook's class. And if you guys want to ask one more question, go ahead. We're just getting one question. Go ahead. Um, how did you how did you get your mom to let you be a storm chaser? <laughs> Sorry, what was that? How did I? How did your mom let you become a storm chaser? How did my mom let me become a storm chaser? <laughs> I th I, it's funny because I just saw my mother yesterday. She lives she lives in Ottawa, and I'm here in Toronto. She um. She's very understanding. My whole family is very understanding. They know that I work very hard to try and be as safe as I can. Um, I didn't start chasing storms until I was much older. Uh, I was about 27 when I started my first uh, storm chases. So I had already moved out and there was nothing she could do to stop me. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, great question. Let's swing back to um, Mrs. Vick's group for our final question. You'll just have to turn your microphone on. On my phone, I can't control your microphone. Go ahead. So I couldn't hear that. Really loud. Actually, I don't think I'm getting your audio. Uh, do you ever get scared was the question. Do, do, do I ever get scared? Yes, absolutely I get scared. Interestingly, if I wasn't scared, then I would probably make a lot of mistakes and that would probably end up getting me into trouble. I don't consider myself to be fearless at all. If I am afraid, that's a signal to me that I need to take action. So if I'm in a situation and I start getting afraid, Let's say there's a storm, a tornado coming towards me, or lightning is hitting really close, or I know that I need to go <laughs> and get ahead of this storm, or else it's going to run me right over. Then yeah. that is a signal to me to 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 you know move to take action right away. So yeah, I get scared frequently when I'm storm chasing, and it helps me to be a better storm chaser. We just wanted to say that if you're ever coming to Ottawa to visit your mother and you'd like to take a little sidetrack off to Fitzroy Harbor, we would love to have you with us. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the invitation. I appreciate that. St. Michael's School in Fitzroy Harbor. <laughs> Excellent. I don't think I've ever been to Fitzroy Harbor. Oh, you're missing out. <laughs> you need to. <laughs> All right. Well, George. Um, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, that was unique. I've never had that happen before. My computer.